All right. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his, pi in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, not with people, not with our boss, not with our co-workers, colleagues, friends, haters, enemies. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil even in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when you are under attack, when you are in battle with the devil when it happens you may be able to stand your ground and having done all you can and after you've done everything to stand stand god give me grace to preach under the anointing of the holy spirit take complete and utter control i really can't do it without you i need you and i'm not ashamed to say i need you lord have your magnificent and marvelous way speak through me and to me that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are all acceptable in your sight and be glorified at the conclusion of the matter. And I'm asking God very earnestly, destroy our ignorance with your truth and speak through and to us that when we leave here, we leave here more armed and equipped than we've ever been before. Help us to walk in the victory that you've already provided. Help to dispel the lies of the enemy who seeks to cause us to feel, appear, and even think we are defeated. Give us what we need and be glorified at the conclusion of the matter. And because we know who you are, know what you're capable of. We bless your, in bless your name in advance. And the people of God that are excited about what he's about to say, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, that ain't much excitement. I said shout hallelujah, hallelujah. and amen. You may be seated in the incredible presence of our awesome God. Those of you who are just joining us in this month, uh, or actually in these two months that we've been dealing with, the changing of seasons, I anticipated that I was supposed to be done with this by now, and that we would be on some lighthearted Christmas uh, story, or that we would be doing something relevant or relative to the Christmas season. But I think that there is nothing more befitting and nothing more relevant in the Christmas season than knowing how to deal with not just the physical change of seasons, but even the spiritual changing of seasons. Last time or the first month we dealt with and we began to discover what it is to live through what it is to deal with and how to handle the waiting season. Anybody still in the waiting season? Amen. Then, then, then you're armed now. You're better equipped to know how to handle the dynamics of the waiting season. Here's what I figured out. It's easier to handle the season. It's easier to deal with the season when you understand what season you're in. And when you understand the dynamics of that season, it gives you what you need in order to be effective at fighting the enemy and or withstanding the enemy's temptations during that season. But also it gives you extraordinary strength because it's better to deal with and or to go through what you understand. Are you with me? Slap your neighbor and say, y'all got to talk back with him today. No, I'm feeling real country and Baptist. I'm country, but I ain't Baptist, but I'm just feeling that way. Push your neighbor on the other side and say, you must talk back today. I said, are y'all with me? I said, is anybody? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Preach, preacher. All the colloquial sayings. I need all of those today. Like, go ahead. Work with it. You got it, doc. Say it. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Listen, the waiting season is one of the most dangerous seasons because it is the time between you asking God, you believing God for it, and him manifesting it, and you seeing it manifested in tangible form. And it's in that season that the enemy begins to sow seeds of doubt, that you start disbelieving what God has already promised. 
that you start swaying away from the truth of what God has spoken and you then become guilty of going against Hebrews 11 and 6 which says without faith it is impossible to please God. So when you become displeasing to the sight of God or when you become displeasing to God or, or you, put, you position yourself in a faithless state, you then lock your capacity to see God do what God desires to do. Because the Bible says that he rewards those who diligently seek him, not those who diligently doubt him. And so you have to be very careful and cautious in the waiting season because the enemy will trick you into believing because it's not happening in the timing that you thought, anticipated, or planned for it to happen. It's not going to happen in your life. So the waiting season, we had to learn about that because it's a dangerous season. And it's imperative that you know and begin to discern what season you're in because if you don't, you'll be operating out of season. I'm really praying that nobody showed up in short pants today. Because you are out of season. And when you're out of season and you don't understand the season you're in, you will be out of order. So it's imperative that you understand the discerning and the changing of the seasons, the spiritual seasons of your life, so that you can best be armed and equipped to know how to handle the season that you're in. Waiting season, dangerous season. But waiting season, it also should be an exciting season for those who are believers because you understand that it just means God is working something out for you and working you working something out of you so that you'll be able to handle it he's getting you ready for it and he's getting it ready for you so i'm in the waiting season because in a few minutes i'm gonna walk into due season and when i get to due season we all gonna shout and rejoice as a matter of fact when i get to due season it's not just gonna be me that's shouting and rejoicing you gonna be shouting and rejoicing because my cup will run it over and if you're standing next to me you're gonna get in the overflow Push your neighbor and say, you better stay close to me. You better stay close. Long as I've been waiting, what he's getting ready for me is going to be so incredible, so next level, so extraordinary. You better be somewhere in the vicinity <laughs> when I walk into my next season. There are several seasons that take place and several seasons that occur, some on a perpetual basis, some in the interim of your waiting season. There are some that happen. There, there can be dry seasons in the interim of you waiting. There can, be, uh, there can be test and trial seasons that come in the interim of you waiting. Then there's, of course, the due season, which is the conclusion of your waiting. But there's another season that I think is, not, is just as important because it is the most frequently and the most commonly visited season of our whole life. Everybody in here will endure this season. Red, yellow, black, white. I don't care how long you've been in church, how saved you are, how sanctified, how holy, how pious you are. I don't care who your mother was. I don't care how sanctified your great-grandmother was. You will go through this season, and it is the season of warfare. Every day that you wake up with breath in your body, you endure warfare. Okay, let me make it plain and help some of you all out. You endure warfare on a continual basis, whether you know it, whether you realize it, whether you acknowledge or not. You endure warfare. You war with your members. You war against your flesh every single day. If you're breathing, you got a war within yourself. Your spirit is warring against your flesh. Okay, I, I see some of y'all are real deep. Let me help you all out. Either you're deep or lost, but either way, I got you. So, so, so let me help you see what it looks like. You warred with yourself when they cut you off in traffic. You were warring. You went into warfare the moment they disrespected you in the store. You went into warfare the moment you got into it with your cousins at the table at Thanksgiving. Because you wanted to say what you knew you shouldn't say, but then you said it in yourself, so you might as well have said it out loud. Because you wanted to say, but you didn't say. You wanted to say, but you couldn't say. You wanted to say, but you wouldn't say. You wanted to say, you wanted to say, oh, you wanted to say it. You wanted to say it. You can act holy if you want to. Oh, no, 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 no. Only the Lord's words come out of my mouth. We ain't talking about what came out your mouth, but I'm talking about what went through your mind. Slap your name and say, he is preaching about you today. My God, he is all in your business. And the truth of the matter is, some of y'all did say it. Don't worry about it. You're a work in progress. Just say, I don't do all the things that I used to do. I don't say as much as I used to say. I don't say it as strong nor as long as I used to. Y'all real sanctified today. Oh, bless his name. Mm. 
You war every single day. I'm trying to get you to understand that there is not a person that is here under the sound of my voice, not a person with breath in your body, with blood flowing through your veins, who has thoughts charging and firing off through the neurons and, and, and the components of your mind. Please understand if you are here, if you exist, if you're alive, you war with your flesh. The enemy makes sure of it. He does everything that he can to tempt you, to push you, to pull you to derail your destiny, to try to pull you off course, to try to pull you down, to, to bring you into the gutter. He tries every way that he possibly can, and he is relentless. He is ongoing. He is perpetual. He does not let up. He does not back up. He does not give up. Notice that this fight is ongoing, and it's been going on a long time. If you don't believe me, just ask Adam and Eve. You war every single day. So because spiritual warfare is so common, because it is so long, has such longevity, because the enemy is relentless in his pursuit to take you out of the will of God, to pull you off course, and to cause you to be disobedient to God, you must be armed, ready, and equipped to do battle with the devil. Otherwise, you will fall prey to his tricks, to his trap, and you will have to deal with the consequences of being rebellious and disobedient to the will of God. You are at war. There is an enemy that roams throughout the land seeking whom he may what? Come on, I got some Bible readers. Whom he may what? Devour. He wants to consume you so that there's no evidence you ever existed. And he comes to do three things. To what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. And this is what I love about, this is what I love about the truth of God's divinity and his revelation knowledge that he's imparted into us through his word. That even though the enemy comes, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the truth of the matter is he cannot kill, steal, nor destroy. We have been given authority over him through Christ Jesus. He says, I've already overcome the world. As a matter of fact, death, hell, and the grave, none of them could hold me hostage. And if he has overcome the final enemy, there is nothing that the enemy can hold against us because the enemy has already been defeated. Newsflash, say this to yourself. Say, self, you are fighting a defeated enemy. Okay, I need you to deposit that into your spirit. You are fighting an enemy that has already lost. And if he has already lost, you have to begin to ask yourself this question. What am I worried about? Why am I panicked? What am I stressed about? He has already been defeated. If Christ defeated him on Calvary, if he overcame the final enemy, which was death, then what in the world am I worried about and I walk in the power and the authority of Christ himself? He's given me the power and the proxy of his name so that there is nothing under heaven over and beneath the earth that comes against and can, be, can prevail rather against the word and the truth of what God has spoken. So because I know who I am and I know who he is, I don't have to be afraid of anything that the enemy throws at me. I simply have to embrace the truth of what God has said about me. There is nothing he can do to destroy what God has created. Watch this. If he could do that, then do you not think that in the Garden of Eden, he would have destroyed everything that they had access to? And or he would have destroyed them. Notice if he came to kill, steal, and destroy, why did he not kill, steal, or destroy Adam and Eve? Why could he not destroy the word that God had already spoken into their lives? Why could he not take their capacity to live off the fruit and the, and the, and the good of the land? Why could he not take away the authority and dominion that God had imposed and invested in their hearts? That he had given them access to be able to have dominion over the things of the earth. Because he just comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He cannot really kill, steal, and destroy. But what he does is he's the author and the father of lies. He's the king of facades. He's a phony. 
he is a fraud and he paints a picture that causes you to think that you are defeated think that you're not going to make it think that you're not coming out of it think that you can't get through it think that you've already lost he's lying the whole time and because you buy into the lies you stop believing what God has already declared and that you have Christ you have victory in Christ Jesus if ever you say tricks are for kids and declare for yourself that I already have the victory because I'm fighting a defeated enemy. It'll cause you to look at him and the next time he tells you you can't, you can laugh in his face and say, you thought I was going to believe that? The next time he says you sick, you look in his face and you say, you thought I was going to believe that? The next time he tells you that you're hopeless, helpless, that it's not going to happen, you can look at him and say, you thought I was going to believe that? The next time he tells you you're broke, busted, and disgusted, you can look and say, you thought I was going to believe that if you knew what I knew but the truth of the matter is he knows what you know the problem is you don't know what you need to know and when you know that you're fighting a defeated enemy you walk into a battle with confidence like come on come on bring your best shot bring your best shot whatever you got I already won over this thing God has already handed you the victory in Christ Jesus, so he cannot kill, steal, and destroy. But let me tell you how tricky he is. He'll make you kill, steal, and destroy yourself. Because he'll cause you now to do exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. He'll cause you to sin against God. Separate. Sin means to separate. It means it pulls you apart from God. And so you now are out of communion and fellowship with God, and you cannot experience the benefits of God. And if you're lied to so long, you'll start believing the lies that you're told. So you've got to stop allowing the lies to be the prevalent uh, component or attribute of your mindset. You've got to now start filling your mind with the truth of what God has spoken because it will cancel the lies and you'll start walking by faith. That's why the Bible says faith coming by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. So the more you know the truth, the more you hear the truth, the less lies you're going to believe. It's like somebody who's been through a lie. Somebody who's lived through a lie. Somebody who's almost been destroyed by a lie. You can't trick them with that lie no more. Because they'll look at you and say, no, 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 no. You know, there was a song, I can't even remember who did it. It was many, 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 many years ago. It was a song, I think back in the 90s, and said, I'll cook your food. What is it? I'll bring your dinner to you. Some, some. I'll rub your feet. You know, it had a whole list of stuff that I'll do. But that's what they told you to get you in the door. Oh, y'all remember? I'm going to give you a minute to catch up with me. They told you the lies to get you in the door. You got in the door. Not, they don't even want to wash their own feet, let alone rub your feet. And so the next person that comes through singing that song, you're looking at them like, please. Try that on somebody else. I've lived through this lie. It's the same thing. Once the enemy has painted a picture and told you his lies, you then come back behind that. And the next time he tries to tell you you're broke, you say, but my God is rich. And he owns the wealth of the world in his hand. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. And I'm an heir to the throne, a royal priesthood. I, God says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. And he's also given me process and access to his resources because he says he'll supply all my needs, not according to what it looks like in my bank account, not according to the world economy but according to his wealth his riches which is in glory endless boundless which is eternal which does not end he is the one that is my source you are just a resource lay me off if you want to but God's already laid up some treasure for me in heavenly places and what I'm about to walk into is gonna look better than what I'm looking in right now Next time the doctor tells you you're sick, you're going to say, whose report shall I believe? I choose to believe the report of the Lord. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity, the chastisement of my peace is upon him. And by his stripes, I'm already healed. See, the next time the enemy comes at you with lies, you're able to hit him with the truth. When you hit him with the truth, there's nothing that you do. You disarm him. You cause him to go back and try again. Go back and come another way because you ain't going to get in this way. Spiritual warfare is a familiar concept. It's something that is ongoing. It started even back in heaven. Satan decided among himself or in himself that he wanted to be God. And if he couldn't be God, he at least wanted to be on the same level as God. 
he exalted himself and said that they shall say the things that they're saying about you. They're going to say those things about me too. Satan wasn't always this way. Understand that he was a walking minstrel. His body was an instrument. When he walked, he made music. The Bible says that the composition of his body was such that he had pipes or horns coming out of his neck. He was an instrument, the chief psalmist of heaven, the chief worshiper. Same one that at some point in time worshiped the Lord with all that he had, with all that he was. The chief psalmist in heaven. But he decided among himself and in himself that he, did, he wanted and desired what God had for himself. And ultimately, the Bible says that Jesus said, I saw Satan and he fell from heaven. And the Bible says he fell like lightning. If you've ever seen lightning, it is a fast strike. It is the speed of light. And anybody that falls like lightning has to have enough force behind it that when he got evicted, y'all know, evicted, that such force was behind it, which, which, which says to me that God made it very clear, I am not to be played with. Anybody that falls like lightning has to have enough force. Can you imagine what kind of force he was evicted with? And where did he fall? In the earth. That's why the scripture says that he is the ruler of darkness of this world, that he roams throughout this land seeking whom he may devour. He is here. He is present. He is an enemy that you cannot see, but you feel the impact of his influence at all times. He is always seeding things in other people's minds and hearts, and he's always seeding things into your mind and your heart, trying to get you to convince and convince you to believe the lies and to fall for the okie doke and go for the hype. And one of the vices that he uses, one of the primary vices that he uses in order to implement and, dis and thrust us or throw us into warfare is jealousy. I talked about it last week, jealousy, 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 jealousy. I think I told this story last week where uh, there was, there was a, a, a person that the demonic principalities had gotten together and started taking a meeting over and they could not figure out how to get this person to sway and to waver because this person was so resolved that they were going to, play, to, to please God. And so the, Satan walks in the meeting and says, listen, I got this. Let me show y'all boys how to do this. Walks over to the man and says, and whispers in his ear, he says, your brother just made bishop in the next town over. Now he was a preacher in the other town. But the seed of jealousy was so powerful and so strong that when he sowed it into the ears of the man that heard it, it was shortly thereafter that the man did everything that he needed to do to destroy himself. And so we've got to know that this is, the, this is one of the vices of the enemy. And nobody wakes up in a day and says, oh my God, I can't wait to go into spiritual warfare. I'm looking forward to warfare today. I cannot wait. But we're thrown into warfare. And you got to be vigilant, you got to be sober minded, you got to be guarded because watch this, some warfare we get into, we really don't have to. Some warfare is unnecessary, it's avoidable because we don't recognize it's the Lord's battle, we decide we want to take the battle on ourselves. L let me help, let me help you out. I I'm going to testify, I'm going to be very transparent here. Most of the problems, and, and people will say this, uh, pastors know this and we say it to each other all the time, uh, it is a common, uh, common understanding, common knowledge among preachers and pastors. But most problems that pastors have are not bred by the people in the pews or the people in the congregation. It's from the seeds of jealousy that have been planted in people who are outside of the congregation. Most of the challenges that we deal with in ministry have nothing to do with the people that are sitting here in the pews listening to the word every single week. But it's people who are not in these walls that the seed of jealousy has been planted in their minds. And now the enemy is utilizing them to do everything that he can to destroy the works of God's hands inside the house of God. Are y'all with me? I'll even take it a step further than that. Most of our problems as pastors don't come even from people outside the walls. But the greatest problems that pastors face are from other preachers. So as soon as I got done preaching last week, now watch this. This is why I'm going to tell you this because it's dangerous. The most dangerous time is when you come out of a battle and you walk out with victory. The time that you're most vulnerable is while you're celebrating the victory that you've already won. You heard me last week. On Saturday, I could not sleep. I wrestled all night long. It was spiritual warfare in my mind. The enemy was trying to fatigue me and wear me down so that I would get to the point on Sunday that I wouldn't be strong enough and I would be so tired that I felt I could not preach this sermon on that Sunday. Well, we won. I preached it last Sunday. The power of God into the room. The Holy Spirit did his work in our hearts. And we came out victorious as a result of it. Watch this. No sooner than I'm preaching this sermon on Sunday, 
the enemy is already perpetuating and putting together his plan to try to pull me off course and to cause me to be thrown into spiritual warfare the moment I leave the sanctuary. As soon as we leave the sanctuary, one of our members, he, he put a post on the social media site of, uh, on Facebook. And he said, I, I'm, he was just celebrating how good God has been. And he was praising God for, the, for his grace and for his mercy. And he put, I'm at the official Victory Cathedral Worship Center, the location. He posted it on his social media site. And just as sure as he posted it, the enemy decided that he was going to, in, with a seed of jealousy, post something that didn't just come at him, but also came for me. Now, let me be clear. I done told y'all, but y'all don't believe me. I ain't always. Let me come closer to you. Let me come. Let me do the windy wind. Come closer. I ain't always walk with the Lord. And, and, and although I, I, I try to make sure the old man is dead, every now and then I got to reach back and choke him a little more. Because now, now what made me angry is that, number one, this same, this same pastor has come for me my whole ministry. Since the day I started the church, he has preached sermons and come for me. He's come for me in every way. He's always coming for me in the barbershop. And I'm like, man, will you just leave me alone? I ain't said nothing to you. And then to add injury to insult, when I see him, he act like he ain't said nothing. <laughs> hey, man, when you gonna invite me over to the church? I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time being fake. I just don't know how to do it very well. I just, I ain't wired like that. I just, I say it like I feel it. I'm not, I don't like you. But I love you, though, in the love of Jesus Christ. God bless you as you go. But this was, this was different. I, I've, never, I've never said anything about him. I've never called his name. I've never come back at him. I've never retaliated. I've never, he's, he, there's nothing derogatory or negative he could ever say that I said about him, even though I know all he said about me. And so this made it different because the enemy figured out, well, I can't get him like this. He done dogged this man out, and this man is still preaching Jesus. He dogged this man. He's still praying and praising God. He ain't even gave this man a second thought. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come at his spiritual children. And it's something about when you mess with your kids. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? You can talk about me all day long, but you just came at my people. It did something. And so let me just tell you, I warred within myself. I even went so far, I'm going to be real honest and just tell all on myself. I wrote the response to sin to him. But I've, I've gotten wise enough now that before I push sin, I call some people who I trust. I have to call and read it to them to make sure ain't no cuss words in it. And so I read it to a couple friends and said, man... I said, let me give you the background, and I'm a little heated now. I said, there's enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I ain't mess with you. I ain't bother nobody. Don't come for me, and you're going to come for me on something. I got a million followers. Do you know my name? Let me tell you, my friend, he said, listen, it was Chris. I'll tell y'all. He said, man, he said, you Mike Tyson about to get in an alley fight. What does this man have to lose and what do you have to lose? He said, you got to see that this is exactly what the enemy wants you to do because he wants the people of God to be fighting with each other because then you can't fight him. And he's pulling you. You're being thrown into warfare because of the jealousy of this brother right here. I need y'all to see that this thing is real. As soon as I preached it, he tested me on it. I'm going to see if you really mean what you're preaching. I'm going to pull you into some unnecessary. Now, what does this brother have to do but all day long sit around and think about ways to attack me on social media? Uh, so I get into an alley fight with somebody, and I'm a prize fighter with a belt on my, on, my, on my wall. I'm in the NBA, and I go out here and fight on the, on the basketball court on the street ball. What sense does that make? 
So you got to be very guarded and very careful. Be sober and vigilant is what the scripture says on your watch and make sure that the enemy doesn't throw you into unnecessary warfare. It don't belong to me. God's got him. And this is what every seed that he sown, he better ask for grace and mercy for the harvest when it comes. Because whatsoever you sow, so also shall you reap. If you sow gossip, if you sow messiness, I'm just trying to help somebody in here because it's not always them. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Because whatever you sow, so also shall you reap. And the battle doesn't belong to me. I need to sit back and say, God, this is your battle. Handle your child. I love him and I love you. Do what you will. Bless him in the way that he will understand. Hurt him if you have to. I mean, be... help him if you have to. That's what, I, that's what I meant. Spiritual warfare is familiar. It is a familiar concept. It goes all the way back to when the enemy waged war against God in heaven, was evicted from heaven, took one third of the angels, and fell into the earth. And because we now live in this earth, we, even though we're not of this world, we are in this world, we have to contend with the spiritual battles that the enemy is waging against us. Even exemplified in the life of Daniel. Daniel was going about his business, but the spirit of jealousy came upon the people in the community and to the extent that they, they went to the king and caused him to issue an edict and a decree that they could not pray, could not honor God, could not be upstanding righteous before God. But Daniel was such a man of God and had such integrity and had a relationship with God that he says, I don't care what y'all say. At the end of the day, God is God. And so I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe God and I'm going to still give God what he deserves. I want to be in fellowship and communion and I'm still going to pray to God. Well, the people who were jealous, who went and seeded this into the king's mind, they couldn't wait to watch Daniel do what, God, what they knew Daniel was going to do. And that was to honor him. He had such integrity, such character that they couldn't impugn him on anything that he was doing wrong. So they tried to bring him down on what he was doing right. Noted, it's, it's not because you're doing something wrong that the enemy is attacking you. It's because you're doing something right. And because you're doing something right, the enemy has to do everything that he can to pull you down and bring you and subject you to the authority of dark powers. But at the end of the day, truth be truth and God be God. Light is light. And he will not allow the darkness to be over, the light to be overtaken by the enemy's darkness. So that you know the rest of the story. They took Daniel. The king reluctantly threw Daniel into the lion's den. But the thing you have to know about walking with God is that God will supernaturally and divinely step in and intervene on your behalf. And when you know that the enemy is a liar, it doesn't matter what kind of den he throws you in. It doesn't matter how many lions surround you and try to consume you. At the end of the day, you'll be sitting in there like Daniel with your feet kicked up talking about God, you got this thing. And whatever the enemy does to try to destroy me, it ain't going to work. You can sit in the circumstance and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I don't care if it's a lion. I don't care if it's a bear. I don't care if it's some tigers. Whatever pit of vipers you throw me in at the end of the day, because God is God, I am fighting a defeated enemy. And when you know you're fighting a defeated enemy, you don't worry. You don't stress. You don't panic. You praise. You worship. You pray. You believe. You hope. You shout. You dance. You do anything that lets the enemy know you will not defeat me and you won't cause me to defeat myself psalms 144 the first number first 144th number psalm the first verse says this blessed be the lord my strength which teach, teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight here's what i figured out that no great fighters are great fighters without having been trained so in order for you to be a great spiritual warrior, you must be trained. None of the greats ever step into the ring without going through months and weeks and sometimes even years of preparation to get them ready for the big battle that they're going to step into. And so everything that you've been dealing with all this year, all last year, all the last three to five years, it has been small skirmishes. You know, in, in, in boxing, they have, they have sparring matches. And they'll find a sparring partner for you to get in so that you can practice and you can work on, on techniques to defeat the enemy when you get into the real fight. So these small battles that you've been fighting really are nothing. It's just God trying to sharpen your skill set to teach you how to pray, to show you that when you step in the ring with your real opponent, when the real battle starts, you are so programmed and conditioned that you don't panic. You just simply go and assume the position and you do, do damage to the devil while he's trying to do damage to you. Why? Because I've been in preparation. 
every fight that I had when I lost my job I was in preparation when I had friends to walk out on me and betray me it was because I was in preparation God was just getting you ready for when you step into the real fight you mean to tell me that this ain't been the real fight no it ain't been the real fight how do you know I was not already in the real fight because you're standing right here as a living breathing testimony that even though you went through the sparring matches you came out of the ring and you still are standing and praising God Slap somebody high five and say, now he preaching to me. If you knew the hell that I've been through, you would understand that I've been in training. He's been teaching me how to stick and move, how to bob and weave, how to duck. He's been teaching me how to do devil. He, dance this way, champ. Dance that way. Go to this side of the ring. Move, duck, bob, weave. Every time the enemy threw a blow, I was ready for him. Why? Because he's already taught me how to fight. The Lord will teach you how to do damage to the devil if you stop complaining and start looking at what he's doing. You ought to thank God that you went through what you went through because if you've never gone through what you went through you wouldn't know how to do battle with the devil when he steps into the ring I already got this victory this time say it to yourself say self we got this thing you just been in training he's just been preparing you he's just been getting you ready for the real fight when the real fight comes, you're going to be praying so hard, the devil going to tiptoe back out the door. When the real fight comes, you'll be pleading the blood so strong, the devil going to have to ease right by your house. When the real fight comes, you'll be standing there with tears streaming down your face, but your hands will be lifted up in holy worship. When the real fight comes, you'll be shouting so hard that the devil will get nervous just being in your presence. Any fighters in the room, I don't need any dead head saints. I don't need any wimpy Christians. I don't need anybody that doesn't know how to sound a voice and sound the alarm in Zion. Somebody stand up and fight. We win in the end. We win in the end. Let me tell you how I know you're a fighter. Because you've been through hell and you still got a hallelujah. Because you've been beaten down but you still got to bless the Lord. Because you've been through, you've been weary but you still got to worship. Somebody in here knows how to fight. Somebody knows what it is to stay on your face all night long and pray and seek the Lord and ask God's power to intervene on your. Somebody knows what it is to go in your kid's room when they sleep and just plead the blood all over the bedroom. Somebody knows how to fight. Tell your neighbors this is a fighter's row. If you didn't come to do battle with the devil, you sat by the wrong row. Because I'm about to get on your last nerve. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of the devil looking like he's winning. I'm tired of going through the hell I've been through. I'm tired of feeling depressed. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of stressing. I'm tired of worrying. And I came to fight. Tell the people around you, say, it's a fight, 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 it's a fight. When we were in grade school and we knew somebody was about to fight, we were running around the whole school talking about, it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight. And everybody in the school would rush to where the fight was because everybody would want to see what was going to happen in the end. Well, I'm trying to tell somebody, it's a fight, it's a fight. It's a fight for your marriage. It's a fight for your peace. It's a fight for your sanity. It's a fight for your job. It's a fight for your kids. And the thing that I love about this fight is that this fight is fixed. We're fighting a defeated. You already won this thing. It's a fight. It's a fight. It's a fight. You got to tell the devil, come watch me. Come watch me take my victory lap. Come watch me take my victory dance. Come watch me get my belt. Come watch me get my trophy. Because at the end of the day, you can't fight what has already been fought. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down.
Listen. I had a friend when I was growing up in grade school. I had a friend named Dion. Y'all remember Dion? Dion was black and ugly. He was my friend. Dion loved me. He was ride or die. And I was always the smallest thing in the class. I was always the littlest person. I had the biggest mouth. I had the greatest confidence. I had the biggest personality. You couldn't tell me nothing. So Dion was my friend. And Dion was, he, he was, he was a fighter. Yeah, if you're going to have a big mouth, you better learn how to be close to the fighters. Let me help some of you saints out. If you're going to have a big praise, you better learn how to be close to the people that know how to spiritually do battle. Are y'all with me? One day I was on the playground. Big guy wanted to talk noise to me. I said, all right. He was like, little boy, you better go on. So I beat you. I said, no, you ain't beating nothing down over here. Little piece of leather, but I'm well put together. I'll cut you. I'll kill you. You ain't beat nothing down. I told y'all I ain't always walk with God. Y'all got to pray for me. One day my mama may tell y'all how I stabbed this boy in the finger with a, in the hand with a pencil. Pray for me. Don't talk about me. We come this far by faith. He was this tall. He was huge. He was humongous. I was scared for my life. It worked for the police officers. He swung on me and I had the pencil in my hand. Oops, sorry. This day, man said he's going to beat me down. I said, no, you ain't beat me down. You ain't going to beat me down. He said, all right, little boy, I'm going to meet you on this playground. I said, meet me wherever you want to meet me, but you ain't going to beat me down. So what he didn't know is I had a Dion. I said, all right, I'll meet you on the playground, doc. I got you. What time? Show me what you're working with. He said, I'm going to get you after school. I'm going to get you. So he went toward all his little friends, little friends gathered around. I said, yeah, you can bring all your friends. Dion, look here. You can't go home early today. We got a fight today. I'm telling you when, you, when you got a big praise, when you got a big worship, you better know some spiritual fighters. And you're telling me, you, you can't go to sleep early tonight. We're going to have to stay up before the Lord because our, our fight ain't with people. Our fight is in the spiritual. So we got to fight today. So Dion... He stayed, he stayed back in the cut. They didn't know Dion was there. So we step up to the fight. And he ready to wear me out. He think he could just beat me down. I said, no, you can beat me down. Now you might beat me up, but you're going to know you've been in the fight. When I get through biting your leg. <laughs> ain't nothing fair in this fight. You're going to go home with some evidence. That you've been in fight with this chihuahua. So I step up. I said, come on. What you gonna do? I had another level of confidence. Because I knew Dion was there. Turn around. Hey, Y'all seen Dion? Dion was gone. I said, well, I'm out here now. It is what it is. So he decided he wanted to square up. I squared up. And all of a sudden, he backed off. I said, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Told you. You didn't want to mess with me. I don't know why y'all talking noise to me. Y'all gone somewhere. Ain't nobody got time to be playing. Well, he backed off. He said, man, I ain't, I ain't trying to fight you, man. We good, man. I ain't, I ain't trying to fight you. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing something bad. I'm, I'm, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. You must have heard about me. <laughs> so finally, they started to turn around, walk off. Everybody started dissipating. I turned around. That was Dion. <laughs> Dion was standing there with me, but Dion had went and got his two older brothers. <laughs> you couldn't have told me I didn't have an S on my chest. Dion, two older brothers were standing on the side of him and Dion was standing there behind me. And so I figured out, later on, I figured out what it looked like. I said, so 
When I get into a spiritual battle and the devil turns around and flees, it ain't because he's looking at me, but he's looking at Jesus who just went and got God and the Holy Ghost. And the devil will turn around and say, I can't come up in that house. It's some power in that. Somebody ought to thank God that you've got a God that will fight for you. <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down. I ain't supposed to be preaching this hard. Fight! It's a fight, y'all. It's a fight. It's a fight. It's a fight. It's a fight. And the battle don't belong to me. Jesus, my big brother, he's standing right here. And he went and got two helpers to help me. For the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, are not carnal. They're not of this world. They're not fleshly. But they're divine power to destroy strongholds. You have weapons at your disposal. I hope I get through all of the weapons. I don't know if I'm going to get through them today. But you have weapons that you need to learn how to use. Again, our fight is not in the physical. It is not flesh. Mind you, the, the preacher that came for me on social media, he's not my problem. It's the enemy that has seated. See, see the enemy walked walk around the town, got in his ear, and whispered, they got more members than you do. They got police outside directing traffic. What you got? That's how slick he is. They got the job and they don't even have as many degrees as you got. They marriage is still together and they went through all this stuff and yours was ended. Well, you know, the doctor said they got cancer. You might as well go on and get their position. That's how the enemy works. And if you fight the people, you're fighting the wrong principality, the wrong spirit, the wrong power. You're fighting the wrong thing. And if you fight in the flesh, you're going to lose in the spirit. Are y'all with me? And so what you have to do is see it for what it really is. Wrestle, uh, Ephesians 6 and 12 says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities, wickedness in high places, the rulers of darkness, the powers, the spiritual principalities, the demonic territory of this world. And when you fight in the right place, it will position your mind to recognize, I don't have to do battle with the person, but when I get through talking to God about this situation, he's going to do one or two things. He's either going to remove the situation or he's going to give me grace to be able to walk through it with my head up unscathed with blinders on and I ain't even worried about what they're saying about me. Yeah, real, real fighters understand that it, it, it's not that you always get out the fight, it's sometimes he has to walk you through the fight. 2 Kings 13, 17 through 18. We have weapons. We have weapons. 2 Kings 13, chapter, the 17 and 18 verse says, listen, oh, this is, this is, this is the story. This is the, the, uh, the dynamic. They're surrounded by Aram. They're surrounded by the enemies. The enemies are taking over the territory. And so they go to Elijah. The king goes to Elijah and says, listen, man, what are we going to do? He's the leader of the Israelites. He's the leader of God's people. And Elijah, who is the prophet of God, the man of God, the mouthpiece, the mantle of God, whom God has used mightily in the past. He has an incredible and impeccable t a testimony and track record of being efficient and being on point with the word of God. So they go to Elijah on his deathbed and say, listen, what are we going to do? Elijah gives them specific instructions. It's intentional. It's specific. Watch this. In verse 17, he says, open the east window. He opened the window. He said, take an arrow, shoot it. So Elijah said, and he shot it. And the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. In other words, it's intentionality, but it doesn't make sense. Why am I taking an arrow? Why am I shooting an arrow out of the window? And why did you say eastward? Why not the westward window? Why not any window? Why did you give me specific, detailed instruction and tell me to shoot the arrow out of this window? And what difference does it make that I shoot an arrow 
out of a window in the first place. So what God is doing is sending a specific and intentional word through Elisha. And he's sending this word to test the level of faith and obedience of the people. And so if we stand there and argue as to why God is telling us to do the things he's telling us to do, we will miss out on the ability to see God do what God has promised and he's going to do. It was not by accident that he chose the eastward because he shouted in the direction of the enemy or the place that the battle was going to take place. So it wasn't that the arrow itself was defeating the whole army. It was the symbolism that you are willing to be obedient even when you don't understand. That's why the Bible says lean not to your own understanding. And the fact that you're willing to be obedient means that you're now functioning and operating in faith. And now that you're operating in faith, God is faithful to reward your diligence. And so it's intentional, it's specific, it doesn't always make sense, but it is intentional and specific. And when God gives instructions, you have to be willing to obey God even when it doesn't make sense. It's symbolic. Shoot an arrow out of the east window towards the place where the battle is going to happen. And God says divinely that arrow is going to be symbolic and representative of the entire army of God that will defeat their enemy, the Arameans, when they come into this battle. But watch this. Here, you, you, let's take it a step further. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. And, and, and the king took them. And he said, strike the ground with them. And so he took the arrows. And he struck the ground three times but then he stopped and so the man of God was angry with him verse 19 and said you should have struck the ground five or six times then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it but now you will defeat it only three times because he struck the ground three times so for every time he struck the ground in obedience to what God says he was symbolically striking a blow against his enemy. Because he said that if you had struck the ground five or six times, you would have completely destroyed it. But the fact that you struck it only three times means that only three times will you defeat this enemy. So if I had kept going and kept striking the ground, you mean to tell me that I would have been able to defeat my enemy? He said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. So what difference does it make that I'm hitting an arrow on the ground? Well, the difference is simply that I'm asking you to do this act of obedience because it symbolizes the destruction or a blow that is issued against your enemy. Not because there were power in the heads of the arrow. Not because his hands were so mighty that when he struck the ground, it vibrated until the enemy's defeat. But it was symbolism. It represented the enemy being defeated or struck down with every strike and only because it was a divine directive that was given by God. Are y'all with me? So speaking of striking, speaking of divine directives, in the 47th number of Psalm and the first verse, God gives us another, uh, an, an access to another weapon that is in our quiver, uh, in our arsenal. He says, oh, clap or strike your hands, all ye people, and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. So you mean to tell me, it doesn't always make sense, but every time I clap my hands, because it's been given as a divine directive that I'm striking a blow against my enemies, and you mean that the longer I clap, the more damage I do to my devil, the more damage I do to the kingdom of darkness, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. In other words, keep clapping your hands. Keep opening your mouth and praising him. Keep shouting like you already got victory. The longer you clap. I used to wonder why old people didn't say nothing. They would just walk around the church. And the fact that you are bold enough 
to let out a shout of victory even before you get through the battle means that you believe God is able to give you the victory that you're shouting about. I just need about a hundred people to clap your hands until the devil gets nervous, until heaven hears the good news. Somebody clap. Don't you stop because your neighbor stopped. You're clapping for your own destiny. You're clapping for your own house and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Celebrate he's defeated. He's already lost the battle. He's already out of the game. Clap your Your neighbor can't clap as long as you, but they're not fighting what you're fighting. They haven't been in the battle as long as you've been in the battle. And if I knew a long time ago that I could clap my hands like the devil is between them, I would have been clapping when I went to the bank. I would have been clapping when I went to the doctor. I would have been clapping. Next time you go to the doctor, walk in the door. Next time you walk in the break room and you know haters are nipping at your heel, just walk in. And if you want to cause the devil to tremble, just shout glory. I'm going to praise him until cancer leaves. I'm going to bless him until my body is healed. I'm going to praise him until my joy is back. I'm going to thank him until clap your know I believe you let God know I trust you let God know it's already worked out in my spirit let God know I still got my job sit down if you can sit down if you can It's symbolic. It's symbolic. The time I clap my hands, I, I strike a blow against the enemy. Not because my hands have power, but because God commanded me to do it. And if God gave me a divine order and I'm obedient to it, I'm going to see what God has said. I need you not to miss this. He says, clap your hands, O ye people, and shout unto the Lord with a voice. of triumph a voice that says I've already won some of y'all shouted but you didn't shout like the money is in the bank you didn't scream like you're already healed you didn't give a triumphant vocal shout that says it's already worked out like the job is yours like the house is yours like your business is gonna make it you better shout like you got it you gotta shout like your children are saved shout like it's coming together shout like it's turning around shout like it's working for your good shout like you're coming out of it shout like you're walking into a new season shout Sit down if you can. Sit down if you can. My Lord, my Lord. Come on, I wasn't trying to preach that hard today. Come on, come on. Second Chronicles. <laughs> Second Chronicles gives us indication of another weapon. I ain't gonna have time to finish all these weapons today. We're just gonna have to endure this for another week. 
listen, Second Chronicles says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for his splendor. Let me give you the backdrop. In Second Chronicles, you see the people of God surrounded. They're surrounded by enemies on every hand. The territory that God has already promised them is now being occupied and they're on the verge of being conquered by their, their, their warring uh, territory, the warring nations around them. And so, in a spirit of confidence, they had sense enough in the middle of warfare to not turn to each other, but they started talking to God. And they went and cried out to him and said, listen, Lord, we've been faithful to you. You gave us this land, but there's a whole lot of people around us and they're trying to take it from us. We see the enemy encamped all around us and let's just be real, God. It's bigger than us. They got more men than we got. More warriors, more soldiers than we have. Their armies look greater than our armies. And we don't know what we're going to do. And God very succinctly, very clearly, very powerfully looks at them and says, Listen, this battle don't belong to you. It belongs to me. I need you all to stand still. In other words, don't panic. Run around like somebody who's wild and scared and afraid. Stop, stop running your mouth telling everybody else how bad it is. Stop elevating and increasing and glorifying your enemy and making him look bigger than me in your eyes. I need you to be still. Quit telling all your business. Quit announcing your weak spot so the devil can see where to attack you. Quit telling him how you're afraid and how to play on your weaknesses. Stand still and see. In other words, watch me work. See the salvation of the Lord. So it's time for battle. They get to the point where now it's time for them to go into the battle posture. And so the, the natural progression of our own understanding would be that if we're going to do battle, we need to have all of the warriors and everybody who is battle ready, we need to have them prepared and get them on the front line. And so we would, I can see us now, we would say, y'all need to sharpen your spears. Get your swords out and put flint on them and make sure that they're ready to slice through the armor of our enemy. Get ready because we don't, we don't have enough people, so we're going to have to come up with a strategy and figure out how to fix this. But notice in the text, they didn't do any of that. They didn't call for the archers. They didn't ask for the infantry to come forward. They didn't ask for any of the, uh, of the dynamics of warfare. They didn't, they didn't find metal to make new shields out of. They didn't even talk about the helmets and the headpieces and the protective co components of their armor that they needed to have in place. As a matter of fact, they didn't even call for the armory to come forward. All of the people who were able to fight physically, all the warriors who had physical training, they weren't even called to the front line. But in verse 21, you see that after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to come out in front of the army of the warring soldiers and said, before we go out into battle, I, before I call for the archers, before the infantry and the footmen come forward, before the armor bearers are brought to the scene, before we pick up our sword and before we pick up our shield, before we grab spear and javelin, before we put on our headpiece, before we have our breastplates on, before we have the gospel, there's something else I need you to do first. Now, it's not by accident that this happened to the tribe called Judah. Because those of us who understand the translation of the word Judah, the translation of the word Judah means praise. So when the enemy encamped about them, they picked the wrong tribe to come in front of. They picked the wrong tribe to try to attack and come against. I want to declare in here that the enemy thought he was going to attack a church. He thought he was going to come against the people of God, but he picked the wrong house of God to come against. He came against the wrong tribe because we came out of the tribe of Judah. In other words, it's not by accident that God named this location, this place opened in the name of Jesus Christ, Victory Cathedral Worship Center. So Jehovah's, Jehoshaphat 
decided it's time for us to go to battle. But instead of calling for all the mighty men, the Bible says that he called first for another group of men. He called for the Levites. I need the worshipers. I need the saints of God who know how to get a praise through who know how to worship God on the brink of battle and I don't need all the other pieces out front but I need the worshipers to go out front and when we get ready to do battle I need you to lift up a song as a matter of fact I need you to sing a song that declares the grace the mercy the faithfulness of God and declares that his love endures forever as a matter of fact don't just sing about God's love but before you sing any lines make sure that your song says give thanks to the Lord in other words don't wait till the battle is over but I need you to sing a song in advance that says Lord I thank you for everything that you have done Lord I thank you for every battle you already brought me through Lord I thank you for how you covered my family when I didn't have sense enough to know how to cover them my Myself. before we lift up a spear before we pick up a javelin before we raise our shield before we call for the infantry before we call for the archers before we call for the armor bearers I need to hear worship I need the worshipers to get out front and go before the army but I'm confused I don't understand that if we're about to do battle why do we need worshipers why do we need praise to get out in front of us well it's because one of your weapons is your praise if you read the rest of the story you'll figure out that when they got out to the battlefield because they praise God because they thank God in advance that by the time they got to the battlefield the enemy had been so confused, had been so discombobulated, had been so messed up that they turned on each other and they started fighting one another. So by the time the children of Judah got to the battlefield all ready to do battle, they had to scratch their head and remember what God had said. He said, I didn't tell you that you were going to have to fight. I didn't tell you to put your dukes up. I didn't tell you to sharpen your spears. I didn't tell you that you were going to have to die. I didn't tell you that you would lose a single man. I told you, stand still and watch me work so before you got here your praise had already reached heaven and by the time the people from the tribe of Judah stepped onto the battlefield they were walking over dead bodies they were picking up the ruins they were taking up the spoils because God had already done battle for them I came to tell somebody you got a weapon and you You've been sitting on your weapon. One of your greatest weapons is your praise. The devil can't understand it. The devil can't understand it. And he can't come, he's confused. And he can't figure you out. Everything that he threw at you, you were surrounded. You lost your job. You lost your marriage. You lost your money. And you almost lost your mind. But you did not, you would not, you could not lose your praise. And he can't understand. How are you still praising? How are you still shouting? How are you still dancing? How are you still standing? How are you still worshiping? How are you still here? It's because I stood still. Bless God. Praise God. Lifted God. And he stepped in, fought depression, fought my cancer, fought my heart disease, fought my haters, fought my enemy. And now I'm stepping over everything that came against me. He's made 
my enemy, my footstool. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. When my enemy came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Somebody praise. Somebody use your weapon. Get off of my house. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my family. Get away from my children. Leave my finances. Give me my joy back. I will bless the Lord at all times. Somebody send up Judah. Send Judah first. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout. 